Well, thank you very much for uh, coming. Welcome to this uh, final policy exchange uh, event of conference season 2014, um, very kindly sponsored by the uh, states of Jersey. And our subject is uh, markets and enterprise making the recovery work for the many, which obviously uh, is a hot topic. British economy is powering ahead, but the concern might be that the benefits are not evenly spread or felt across uh, the UK. So I'm going to introduce our four panellists. Um, Elizabeth Truss will be known to all of you. Fast rising Tory star, Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Steve Hughes, who's the Head of Economic and Social Policy at uh, Policy Exchange. Senator Philip Uzif, am I pronouncing that correctly, Philip? Very good. Yeah. Uh, who is the Treasury and Resources Minister uh, uh, from the Government of Jersey. And James Sproul, who is the Chief Economist uh, at the Institute of Directors. So I'm going to ask all the panellists to speak for five or six minutes, and shall leave the maximum amount of time for people to ask questions uh, and to join in the discussion. So the first speaker I'm going to uh, uh, call to speak is uh, Liz Truss. Well, thank you very much, Ian. And I think the um, we had a very interesting set of speeches yesterday in the economy debate, and I hope uh, everybody heard Digby Jones. And what, what I thought was particularly good about his comments was highlighting the importance of the profit motive for promoting free markets and free enterprise, as well as good living standards for everybody in this country. And it, one of the things I did when I entered Parliament was set up the Free Enterprise Group, uh, which I can no longer be a member of as a minister, uh, but I'm still a great supporter of free enterprise and competition and I think what this government has shown is by unleashing enterprise by allowing uh, the private sector to develop we've delivered or the, the, the companies themselves have delivered two million uh, more private sector jobs 400,000 more businesses and we're now the fastest growing economy in the G8 and the most important thing uh, to be able to make recovery work for the many is for more people to be in work and of course, that's a combination of the welfare programme, uh, the education programme, the increased number of apprenticeships, but it's also about unleashing companies to be able to employ people in the first place. And I think, as a Conservative Party, we should be proud of our support for free enterprise, proud of our support for the profit motive in driving the economy forward. And you know, the, what Labour did, which was create a lot of jobs built on sand that they couldn't afford to pay for in the long term uh, was, was one of the, the many parts of their undoing. Now, DEFRA um, yesterday was part of the economic debate, and that hasn't always been the case, but I was delighted that as a department we were part of the economy session, because food and farming is actually Britain's largest manufacturing industry. It's bigger than cars and aerospace put together. Some people see it as a sunset industry. I think that's completely wrong. It's actually a sunrise industry. We have a lot of entrepreneurs going into food. It's a very um, high-tech sector as well with things like you know, GPS in tractors, you know, automated celery rigs, and you know, huge, huge amounts of technology across the supply chain and huge opportunities for the sector to grow and be efficient. And the Chancellor in his speech specifically mentioned the advanced technologies he wants to open up to grow our crops uh, more sustainably. Uh, you know, making sure that our farmers and producers have access to the same range of technologies that producers do in the United States, very, very important. And I don't think Ed Balls mentioned, mentioned anything about the food or farming industry in his uh, speech at conference, although uh, maybe he forgot he forgot to mention that. The, the, so, you know, we are recovering. In fact, the, the food industry has seen a 70,000 increase in jobs uh, in the last year. And also, we've seen a 1 billion increase in exports. 
I think one of his great successes in this government is making sure that we're using our embassies overseas to promote British trade and promote British product, products and try and address uh, the trade uh, imbalance we've had in the past. What do we do to make the recovery work for many? Well, I think it's more competition, it's more markets, it's more freedom uh, to allow those new businesses to set up. It's removing the red tape to allow small businesses to grow into big businesses, uh, which is what we want to see. We're doing our part in DEFRA, although we do face the EU as one of the main sources of uh, lack of competitive policy. So, for example, the new common agricultural policy is demanding that farmers grow three particular crops, uh, which is not what the market wants, it's what the European Union wants. And I think farmers should be growing what consumers want to buy, uh, rather than what the European Union wants them to sell. But. You know, by, by doing this, by opening up the market and by increasing trade, we can actually make sure that consumers have affordable food and that more people are employed in industry. And if we manage to replicate that further across the country, then I think further across the economy, then we can have a very, very strong uh, proposition at the next election, which is what the Chancellor outlined. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next call on Steve Hughes. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the two things I want to talk about today are the labour market and access to finance, because these are both examples of where people believe that markets aren't currently working for the many, which is obviously the title of the subject today. Taking labour markets first, um, prior to the financial crisis, there was a huge shift in our labour market and composition of it and pressures facing it. In the ten years before Lehman's collapse, there was the introduction of the national minimum wage, there was increased globalisation where new markets developed and opened up, and that meant there was more low skilled, uh, cheap labour available to make products. There was the impact of globalisation within itself where task-based labour uh, that was previously done by humans started to be done by technology. Uh, and there was also the impact of the supply of Eastern European migration on the labour market as well. And then what happened in the financial crisis was there was a huge shock to the economy and there was a huge drop in output. But what we expected to see in the labour market didn't really materialise. Employment fell, but not as far as we thought. Unemployment rose, but again, not as far as we thought. And there's two reasons for this. The first reason was that uh, firms were hoarding labour, and the reason they were hoarding labour was because they were scared of losing skills when the upturn came around. I worked for a British lobby firm at the time, and some of the stories that we heard were quite staggering. It was examples of highly skilled engineers and designers painting forecourts, for example, just so that the skills weren't lost on demand returns to the economy. Um, the other thing that happened was that we saw a huge drop in pay in real terms. So looking back to 2007 and where wages were there, taking account of inflation, wages were about 10% lower than they were then. Essentially our workforce took a big pay cut to stay in work and it's only because of that that they did stay in work. And this brought in issues such as zero hours contracts and temporary work agency work as well. But I'd make the argument that that is the, an example of the market working. It's much better to have those people in employment than not in employment. And it's important to remember that. One way that we could sustain employment better, and there have been you know, examples of policies put forward by Labour that we don't necessarily agree with, such as mandating that the minimum wage should be eight pounds something an hour by the 2020. That's not the right approach to take. If we want to make employment work and people be paid more, and more people in employment, the best thing to do would be a targeted tax cut. A tax cut, the best option for that would be employers' national insurance, which drives a wedge between what an employee is worth and what an employee is paid. Now, obviously, in the fiscal environment, that is quite tough. That's not necessarily easy to do because it will cost billions of pounds. But if we could find some way of funding that, that would be a fillip for the economy. And the second thing that I'll briefly talk about is banking and finance and access to finance. This is an area where markets have changed dramatically over the last 10 years. The advent of technology and banking has meant that people can do it online, via their phone, whichever way they want. 
It also means that businesses can access finance in different ways, such as peer-to-peer -peer lending. But we have to remember who these markets are potentially leaving behind. So, for example, mobile banking apps have meant that there's less need for bank branches. Banks are retreating from the bank branch model. But ultimately, there are 10 million people in the UK that don't have basic digital skills. So, that means they can't access emails, they don't send emails, and then use search engines. How are these people engaged in these new markets? Um, and that leads to questions about competition in banking as well. Uh, and I'll use the example of SMEs, uh, <coughs> crash recoveries. Again, people have used this as examples of markets not working, but we've seen the advent of organisations such as Oldermore, Handles Banking, and the alternative access to finance providers as well, because they're ultimately the market responding to an issue. SMEs aren't getting what they want from traditional bank finance providers, so they're going elsewhere. Sure, they're not a big part of the market yet, but it takes time for markets to change in their composition. So I guess the final thing I'd say is that the final financial crisis has shone a spotlight on some issues within markets, how they're constructed and how they operate. But ultimately, there was problems and shifts in technology and globalisation that were causing those problems in markets in the first place. It's important we remember that and understand that government can't necessarily always do things to help problems or perceive problems in those markets. Thank you very much. And uh, next, um, we're going to hear from Philip Buzov. Uh, thanks very much indeed. Um, well, it's uh, great uh, uh, to be here. Um, you might wonder why um, a Minister for uh, the Treasury and Resources Department of Government of Jersey is here in Jersey. Well, um, we're here because we have a long-standing and very important uh, re relationship with the uh, uh, United Kingdom and the United Kingdom government. It's a relationship that we value uh, very strongly. We've uh, been in this relationship since uh, uh, since 1204, uh, more than 800 years, uh, and uh, we've been through some uh, difficult times, uh, but uh, um, some very good times uh, too. We think we have a role to play uh, in continuing to help um, uh, uh, forge um, the UK um, recovery in the work that uh, we do. Um, it's an interesting time for uh, me personally at the moment because we're in the middle of our own general election in Jersey. Uh, we don't have party politics, uh, we're all independents and uh, I'm 16 days away of uh, facing the electorate uh, after six years as being the Treasury uh, Minister in Jersey. And I have to convince uh, voters in Jersey that the policies that we have been pursuing um, are uh, the right policies um, and that whilst we have been through the global contagion, many of the uh, remarks that have already been said, uh, we've seen the problems in Jersey, much of the conference discussion um, uh, about, about how to get the economy broadly, uh, recovery broadly based and felt uh, to people throughout these um, islands, um, uh, how do you actually achieve that? Well, uh, you may wonder why uh, that is relevant in Jersey. We're uh, in the fortunate position. We've had uh, quite prudent policies in relation to our public finances over many uh, decades. We've got 100% of GDP on our balance sheet. Uh, and my job as Treasury Minister has been to uh, keep it that way uh, and not to allow uh, our ministers and our politicians and our parliament to spend it. Um, uh, because uh, that's uh, in an imprudent way. Uh, we have cut spending and we've, interest, we've invested in infrastructure um, and uh, we're strong uh, and we think we can get economic growth uh, returning uh, because we've got those strong public finance. And I appreciate the difficulties that the Chancellor um, has um, here. But what I think is absolutely right, and this is where the Jersey, I think, uh, relationship works, is we are effectively a capital warehouse. Uh, we provide um, about um, half a trillion um, of uh, sterling into the UK economy by foreign direct investment. Lots of discussion about how to get business uh, started. I remember George Osborne speaking about putting, uh, putting steroids on um, and, uh, and all of the debate about quantitative easing. Uh, well, tonight there's 120 billion of uh, sterling deposits which are upstream to the UK, uh, and that money is flowing into the UK uh, banking uh, system. And businesses need capital to invest. Uh, they need uh, all those innovative things <coughs> now um, of actually getting into capital. I was fortunate enough to also go to level 39 Canary Wharf uh, just a couple of weeks ago. The Chancellor made those remarks about um, innovate finance or the new world of competition in finance. We're absolutely aligned uh, with uh, that agenda. We think competition um, is really uh, important. Uh, I'm also a farmer's son, if I may say. 
Um, and, um, and I see, I hope you don't mind me mentioning, we have a, a, a distinguished individual who knows about the farming agenda, Sir Lockwood Smith, the High Commissioner of New Zealand. Uh, and ah, he, to me, yeah, is a, a godfather in terms of that whole debate about uh, the points that you make, which is uh, farming and food um, is not a sunset industry uh, with the right policies uh, and the right support from government. Actually, it can be a sunrise. Uh, and as a farmer's son, um, I fu fundamentally believe that. And I think we've got a lot to learn from uh, uh, New Zealand. Uh, uh, we in Jersey uh, want to be part of the uh, family of the, uh, of the United Kingdom uh, and the British Isles to get the economy going, to make that economy broadly based and sustainable. You can only do that with capital. Uh, we provide that capital for businesses uh, and for infrastructure projects. That's the solution, not more debt uh, in order to get um, the economy going. Thank you very much. And finally, we're going to hear from uh, James Sproul from the IOD. Well, thank you very much. Um, making the recovery work for the many. That's, um, that's actually, if you know a lot about politics or you follow politics a lot, which um, I think I'm fairly safe in assuming that most of you do, um, if you're here at a political party conference, you know that this, this phrase is actually loaded with a lot of meaning. Working for the many, brackets unsaid, not for the few. All right, so I, what I'm going to talk about is um, two things, wages and unemployment and, and short-term stuff, and then some longer-term things, which have been in the news a lot uh, recently, perhaps not so much in the last couple of months, but I think are important and really fueling the question behind it. So um, what's been happening in the short term? Well, wages and unemployment. Um, if you had said to any economist five, six years ago, by the way, the UK is about to go into the worst recession we've had since the 1920s. The 1930s recession was not as bad as the 1920s recession in the UK. Um, what do you think is going to happen to unemployment? I think the, the average economist would have said, and I would have said, well, it's going to head towards 14, 15% pretty quick. Why did it top out? 8.4. Why did the unemployment in this country not go up as significantly as any economist would have expected? There's actually been a change in the way of, that our industry works, that our companies work, and that employers and employees have worked together. And I think it's extraordinarily important to note that. And what essentially the deal has been, I as an employee will not make wage demands, you as an employer will do your best to preserve jobs. And that deal has really worked. Now, when we're saying making the recovery work for the many, what we're really, uh, the subtext in my view is, it isn't working for the many. And my view is, actually, it is. It is working for the many because what you've done is you've preserved many, many people in jobs. They may not be getting as many hours as they like, they certainly aren't getting the pay rise as they would like, but they have kept employment up at levels which would really startle, I think, almost every economist who looks at it. So that's the first thing. Second thing is we, we just um, surveyed our uh, members on where do you expect wage rises to go? And in, invariably, the response has been, uh, we're expecting them to go up the next year, but, and this is key, we're expecting them to go up in line with corporate performance, which is to say, in line with what we can afford to pay, which is to say, UK productivity is not going to suffer as a result of putting up wages above the level of productivity which would be, for the long term, very, very damaging. So I think I'm actually extremely pleased. Of course I would like um, people to get more money, but I would want that be, to be justified by corporate performance. So I'm very, very optimistic, and I think that it is coming. The, corporate, the, the, the uh, economic recovery is taking a bit longer than, than anybody expected, um, but that's probably due to the nature of any credit uh, downturn. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about that, uh, and I think we're on the right path. Um, it's, it's sort of just a little bit more time, please. The bigger thing which I, I'm just going to touch upon a bit, because uh, I think it's, it's relevant and, and applied within the question, um, is society becoming more unequal? Uh, this is the, the famous Thomas Piketty thing where he, his clear answer was yes, uh, my clear answer is no. Um, there's a thing which uh, uh, economists look at called a Gini coefficient. He's an Italian fascist uh, economist from the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and a Gini of one means one person has all the money, a Gini of zero means it's uh, equally distributed across the entire economy with no reference whatsoever to uh, merit or effort. Um, clearly you don't want to be one, clearly you don't want to be zero, you want to be somewhere in between. The UK bottomed out, i.e. the most equal that we ever got was in the late 1970s. We got a, a Gini coefficient of about 0.26. By the way, that was about the same time as the Soviet Union, so give you an idea of how, how wonderful the, the UK was in the late 1970s. We were down there with the Russians on, on that sort of thing. Um, and since then, it's, it's gone up quite markedly. It's gone from about 0.26 to about 0.36, which is a reasonably um, steep rise. And for those who say you could only uh, grow an economy uh, as you, um, uh, with low Gini, that's absolute nonsense. 
you look at the UK over the 1980s, our Gini coffee shop was rocketing at the same time that the economy as a whole was going. And I just want to touch on why we're not going to move back to that, that for the left ideal situation. And I actually think we're in a much more ideal situation now. First of all, the shape of the economy has changed. In the 1970s, you had um, large uh, industries with people who were simply um, operating a, a large machine, a capital intensive machine, and they weren't justifying large amounts of, of wages themselves. It wasn't their skill, it was the capital that they were employing that was the thing that, that uh, made that, drove their wages. So we've, we've really changed the structure of the economy away from a lot of manufacturing towards much more services, and that has changed the way in which people are remunerated. Uh, secondly, is uh, along with that, individual pay bargaining has become the norm. Trade unions don't tend to like um, uh, wide wage differentials, and in the 1970s they were very powerful. With the fall of trade unions, you see many more people um, negotiating their wages, and you see a much, much greater dispersion of wages across the economy as a whole. And finally, and this is most critical, and we'll wrap it up back to the whole recovery in, in, with this, um, there was, in the 1970s, um, punitive levels of taxation. Uh, we know that the basic rate of, of operating tax is 83%. How many of you would want to ask for more money from your employer if you had 83% of it taken away by the government? There was simply no point in asking for more money. The government just got it all. Um, and moreover, and, and I think this is crucial to you know, making the recovery work for the many, because I think that the way the recovery will work for the many is by having a very dynamic economy. Um, not only did you not bother to ask your employer for more money, you didn't bother to start your own company. Why go through the risk? Why go through the, the heartache and, and all that effort if, if you were successful, the government's going to take all the money from you, and if you, were, you know, might as well go and work for the state, and you know, then we'd be able to knock off at five every day and, and have an easy life, at least on that sort of thing. So I think we're not going back to that type of economy. We're clearly going to be having a much more dynamic economy. I think that the UK, um, if we look internationally, uh, I always say that the UK is top of the league in uh, entrepreneurship um, if the league is Europe. The problem is, the European League is the bottom of the world. So we're the best of the worst, as it were. So we're pretty good, uh, but there's a lot, a lot of things we can do better. And if you want to talk about more, more about the questions, I'm more than happy to do. Thank you very much. Fascinating. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to all of our panelists. Now I'm going to open it up to questions, and anxious to get as many questions in as possible. Who wants to go first? The lady <coughs> up here. We have a microphone on its way. Hello, thank you very much, panel. My name is Rachel McLean. I'm the candidate in Birmingham North Hill, which is just down the road from here. It's one of our target seats for the party. And um, I totally take on board everything that you say. I'd just like to make one observation, which is I think the debate about um, for the many and equality and everything that you've discussed is a bit like the debate on immigration, in that there's a public perception of what immigration does to communities, and then there's the reality. And as we all know, we all in this room know those, those two things are very different. And it's a little bit like the whole debate that you just described very well, in that we know, as you described, and we believe that wage recovery is coming to the economy and it's going to take time. But if you are a, a person working on an average wage, you might not necessarily feel that way. And I think what we've got to do as politicians is to get understanding of people feeling that way and that's very difficult at the moment sometimes for, for me on the doorstep, and I'd welcome anyone's thoughts on that particular issue. Liz, do you want to respond first? I mean, what, you know, there, there's a fair point about, you know, we are in difficult times, and you know, we know about the crisis situation that we inherited, and we, you know, we do have to talk about that and say, you know, where we've come from, but we also have lowered the tax, tax rates for or lowered the tax rate for 25 million people, which is a very important point, that where we have been able to reduce tax, we have done it and we have targeted those specifically on low incomes to make it worth people's while going to work, which is which is very important. So, you know, the, what we have to do at the next election is, you know, there are two alternatives. You know, one alternative is a Conservative government led by David Cameron, the other alternative is Ed Miliband and the prospect of ending up like France, which you know, famously a few years ago, Ed was saying that <coughs> Francois Hollande was his you know, idol and, and you know, he wanted to go ahead with what, what's going on. And we can see in continental Europe what happens if we don't uh, adopt the, the approach we have in terms of fiscal consolidation, in terms of um, you know, increasing our competitiveness. I just, I wanted to come back on the point James makes about the labour market. I think 
you know, there's a fundamental issue there, which is that there is a returning, there is an increasing return to skills. And skills are becoming much more important as the, you know, as the shift great. between labour and capital. And that, you know, going back to my previous brief, that is why education reform is so important. And one of the things we do have to say to people is, it's so important for your child's future, you know, the level of education they're getting, what, what happens at school, particularly in basic education in areas like literacy and numeracy. That is so vital now. Uh, in a way, it just wasn't. You know, 50 years ago, and that's you know, one one very encouraging thing I think about the next generation of young people coming through is they recognise that you know, they are empowered to go off and do things, and they do take they do want to take responsibility for those decisions. And I think that's something we we, we have to get across. To. I also just wanted to. Uh, say to the government of Jersey, you, know, you are going to be facing competition from the Norfolk Pier potato to the Jersey Royal. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be tough times ahead for Jersey. It's a premier, it's a premier potato. James, you, you, would, you would accept, presumably, that while there's an economic rationale for why many people's wages are flatlined and living standards are flatlined, that actually the political reality is that if that continues year after year, and it's a long time now since the financial crisis, that you must understand people's anger, surely, and that that poses a, a, a huge political problem for the, for the Conservatives and for the political establishment in general. I, I think it does. I, I think that if, you know, we've been discussing, we've been here for, since Sunday, um, and discussing well, why has the Conservative um, position of the polls been so um, not reflected the recovery, the growing recovery, and, and the, the, the only explanation you can come to is that because wages have risen. Now, I think we can overplay that too, because I think that people do realize that there's been a trade-off between, um, I'll keep yeah, my job, I think that's right. and, and I won't make wage rises. And people, you know, they're, they're not angry in the same way that you might have seen in other <coughs> parts of, of Europe about the political anger. There's an exasperation that's taken as long as it does. But I don't think anybody's in any confusion as to you know, the degree of difficulty the UK is an economy, and as a government was, um, you know, when this government came into power and the, the, the overspending, uh, I found that the, the almost denial of it, well, complete denial of it by the Labour Party, really quite surprising. Um, you know, they're talking about balancing the budget, but I, I would have thought that would be higher on their priority list. Steve? Yeah, so I think on, on this issue that one of, the, um, one of the important points is the fact that the reason we're talking about markets for many, whether it's not working, recovery is not working for many, is Got very high headline growth, and yet not everybody's experiencing an increase in their living standard. Um, but it's important that that doesn't mask the fact that our economy is still a long, long, long way from normal. It's nowhere near it. And over the next five years, whoever wins in 2050, we're still going to have interest rate rises because we're still at 0.5%. We're not even halfway through deficit reduction programs. And that's going to, the kind of policies that are implemented, such as we saw yesterday. Um, they're going to have an impact on people, they're going to continue having an impact on people. But I do think there is recognition from the general public that this repair job needs to continue. But I'm just not really entirely sure how it will marry up the fact that there will be continual policy proposals that will have to uh, address the issues still created by the financial crisis uh, and the fact that there still might be headline economic growth. Um, I, I'm going to have to come and talk about the um, North Potato, I'm afraid. But, but, uh, my, my general message is, is that there is room in life for more than one uh, product. Actually, it's about And all I would say, and all I'd say is that the Jersey Royal, planted in our, our southern uh, most position of the British Isles, can just be planted a little bit earlier than the Norfolk. A wonderful tasting potato. We get ours in early. Um, we get them to the market in May, uh, and um, and then we can uh, and your potatoes can come later, and you'll get just as free. Sounds like it's fine. To me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that it, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's complementary. That we can we can both we, we can both be winners in this. Um, I mean, we've faced an interesting position in Jersey because we saw a situation where, because of an absence of competition policy, um, we actually had uh, inflation which was um, above that of the UK. Uh, since we've introduced the competition law in 2005, actually we've seen inflation as a lower rate than the UK, but wages have been higher. Yet I'm in the middle of an election 16 days away where even though wages have been higher than inflation, uh, people are still not feeling confident. 
Uh, and that's really where um, your, um, it is about feeling confident, it's about believing the best, as an economist uh, from, uh, that we've recruited into a fiscal policy panel, the best fiscal stimulus <coughs> is energy confidence. And governments that are clear, uh, and I commend the UK government, I commend the Chancellor in relation to these very clear statements about what Britain is going to be in terms of the digital economy. All the things that you were saying about uh, using technology, enhancing technology in whatever, in whatever area, tractor driving, uh, getting fertilisers appropriately delivered, uh, finding different ways of getting produce to market, uh, north of potatoes or Jersey. Uh, it's all about technology and it's about a way that we uh, um, get competition uh, and use technology to get um, more um, small businesses, bigger businesses, um, acorns of the future will grow. That's, that's the way. But even though we have that strange position in Jersey, people are still not feeling as confident as we think they should be. Next question. Gentleman, gentleman here, please. Um, mm, thank you. Yes, m my name's Richard Simmons. Um, I'm really the two capacities I refer to. I'm chairman of BPP University, uh, and uh, I am a part-time advisor to my son who's uh, starting a new agricultural business in Jersey. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not a voter in Jersey, but he is. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what, what I wanted to, what, what I wanted to raise, I, I, I agree with uh, what everybody has said, but the one thing I'd like to pick up is I think, and the thing that frustrates me constantly in various businesses that I'm in, I think that we've got so much potential uh, within our economy, and there are a, a whole raft of supply side barriers mm -hmm. to growth. Yeah. And we need to, uh, there's, a, there's a number of things that are needed, but one of the th key ingredients to tackle uh, some of these is political courage. And I was very encouraged yesterday by uh, George Osborne taking the HS2 head on. Yeah. I mean, housing is one where I think we, you know, it is absolutely crazy that we can't break through and get, open up development at a faster rate than we are. And turning to my own field, education, at a policy exchange for him yesterday, uh, which uh, BPP sponsored, I mean, we were making the point that there is no earthly reason why we're committed to three-year degree programs when we've got a great demand to educate more and more of the population, we could do it much more cheaply, or we could do it much more effectively. And again, there's barriers uh, within mm. the system. So that is where I'd like to direct you. So you'd like to hear from the panel what? Uh, well, well, yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah. focus just around this, you know, the opportunities to create greater wealth for all of us yeah. <laughs> uh, through supply side activity. James. Um, well, certainly I think that the, the education sector, particularly the, the higher education sector, is going through an enormous revolution. Um, I don't think it's just the, the massive online and open courses. I think what's uh, happening, and, and even more obviously, is challenges from people like BPP, but also um, what the um, fact that so many professors are putting their lectures online is doing is showing students what good professors are like. And that means that poor professors are put in a very in a cold light, and the students say, why aren't you inspiring me in the way that Professor Bloggins is? Yeah. Uh, and that becomes a real difficulty for them. So I think there's an enormous amount of opportunity out there, um, and that opportunity is going to cause the supply side revolution. Supply side revolutions can be driven by the, the users who are wanting to, more and more opportunities, and they're going to want those more opportunities because they see, well, this is available in the States, or this is available, in, you know, you watch a, a great professor from one of the big, you know, leading world universities in the States or whatever, think, why don't I have more like that? Uh, and that's what, that's what I think. I think it's yeah. going to be really, really interesting. The disruptive power of the internet. Steve, um, on the supply side, if you take the example of infrastructure policy, this is where the UK really falls down. And if you look across a lot of indicators on the UK, uh, we actually come up pretty highly in terms of stability of our institutions, the quality of our workforce, etc., etc. But on infrastructure, we're way down the list, and that's where one of the real problems is. A couple of examples for you would be house building, some mentioned house building, our estimates are that we need to build 300,000 homes a year to cope with future demand but also to make up for the current shortfall in supply, currently building around 100,000 just over. Um, the South East Airport capacity debate keeps going around in circles, I mean we've got the Davies Commission now but 
if the Davies Commission next year recommends a third runway at Heathrow as the best option of supplying airport capacity in the South East and gets cross bike support, we'll essentially be in the same position as we were eight or nine years ago. And that's eight or nine years where in the globalised world, other countries are developing their infrastructure and catching up and giving their businesses competitive advantage. Liz Truss, I mean, is the, has the government really done enough on the su supply side since 2010? Um, I, will, I will answer that question. I just wanted to <laughs> say on the subject of, I Jennifer. completely agree on infrastructure <laughs> and, but also skills. If you look at the World Economic Forum's competitiveness report, that's the other area where we've got issues in the recent PISA table, which is why education reforms are so important. And because skills have become increasingly a core part of the economic, you know, a more, you know, returns to skills are increasing, I think it's a, it's a very important point. On your question about has the government done enough, it, we have done quite a lot on supply side reform. Um, there is more that we would want to do. There's more a conservative majority government could do. Uh, and I think it's a, you know, it's a major area where we can uh, have a positive effect. So we have made some changes in terms of labour market policy. Um, there are also, you know, there's been tax changes. It's going to be, we'll have to wait for the manifesto to be released to see the full you know, panoply of what, what we're going to say. The specific with reference to my portfolio in DEFRA, um, you know, we have some very, very efficient, competitive parts of the industry. So if you take the poultry industry, that's, you know, that is very competitive with the best countries in the world in terms of the poultry industry. It's 85% self-sufficient in the UK. It really is extremely competitive. And, but there are other parts of farming that are less competitive. And one of the things I'm looking at is what are the supply side barriers that means that poultry is so efficient and competitive and other sectors are less competitive. And there are all kinds of issues and regulations, a lot of it comes down to the EU. And this is why <coughs> renegotiation is so important and the 2017 referendum is so important because a lot of things are coming through, whether that's on the environmental side, which has a huge impact on business, or on the agricultural side, mean that you know, we are facing a flow of regulations coming from Europe. So while we're reducing the level of regulations set at a UK level, uh, we do have those, those those EU regulations to contend with, so that that is a that is a big problem. But you know we have to look at it as we're not just competing with the rest of Europe. You know, we are competing with a global a global market. You know, countries like China, which are you know, rapidly developing and you know, a hugely skilled uh, workforce coming on stream. You know, making huge progress, so we need to not just benchmark ourselves against you know what's going on going on with Europe. You know, in some cases, like France, I've mentioned. You know, we need to look at the world out there and see you know what is the best practice they're using. What are the what are the best examples of competitive markets that they're developing? But across the world, you know, the best way of getting things done is to have proper market competition, lower regulation, lower taxation. That's what works. Philip, um, I mean, we see our role in um, in actually sourcing that competitive capital that um, the economy needs to invest, uh, and that's why we are in no doubt. I mean, that we're living in a very competitive world, and um, as our historic relationship with the City of London, um, the money that we manage, the clean, uh, um, a reputable, um, you know, high quality, um, uh, evidenced uh, capital that we've got in Jersey. Um, we're competing with other centres, and if we can attract capital into London, into Jersey, we upstream the majority of that to London, and that's capital that might not be invested in Singapore or in, in Asia. So we see that as our role. In terms of um, supply side, um, I read the Kate Barker review on housing in 2004, um, and, and that simply wasn't implemented. Um, that's one example where clearly you need capital to invest in housing. Without any, for any investment in housing, uh, you're not going to get as, as, as difficult as it is politically, both in Jersey and the UK, uh, to deal with housing issues and planning consent. You're just simply not going to be able to. You're going to see a rising um, house prices, which basically erode people's standard of living in the same way that we were talking about wages earlier. So that's it's absolutely vital to do that. In Jersey, we've actually, um, we've actually taken some pretty bold decisions. 
uh, we're actually rolling out fibre to every single home and business mm -hmm. by, uh, by the end of next year. We've taken a bold decision. We were criticised for it at the time. Uh, but I think it was the right thing to do because whether you're a poultry farmer or whether or not you are, um, whether you're running a small business right. in the Shetlands or wherever, um, it is the digital superhighway which is the chance has been staying, um, which is absolutely, absolutely fundamental to that, uh, to getting that yeah. technology and its skills. And it's giving people e-learning as well. Okay, so next question time. I'm going to move to take questions in batches of three because I'm conscious lots of people want to get in and want to give people a chance to, to, to have their say. So first question right at the back. Thank you. Uh, Chris McBride from the Social Investment Business. We provide finance to charities and social enterprises. One of the, I want to go up to Steve's point on access to finance. Um, one of the ideas to improve that is a version of the US Community Reinvestment Act which uses transparency of banking activity area by area to kind of encourage lenders meeting the needs of borrowers in all areas of the community by the panel schools on if they thought that may work somehow in the UK. Thank you. Next. Adam here. Uh, so I think for too many people, the answer to Melbourne's question as to whether or not they're better off now is uh, in five years' time to compared to the last question is no. But I wonder what uh, the panel thinks about the rebalancing in the economy because actually if you look at sectoral breakdown, wages in manufacturing and construction are actually seeing quite strong nominal wage growth, in fact reaching real wage growth and, and most of the uh, reduction has come from the public sector and from finance. So I wonder uh, in terms of whether the, the economy, the recovery is working for the many rather than few, what, what sort of impact rebalancing has on that. And another question. Gentleman here in the middle please. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm Dunn from Whitton. Um, for me, the most interesting point that came from the panel work was James's remarks about the perception of what's happened in the, from, in the recent financial crash uh, differing from the reality. And uh, I feel that the perception now in this country is one that uh, London is growing, London in the southeast and the rest of the UK isn't. I don't know if that's true or not. And also, when we see headlines that FTSE CEOs are being paid significantly more than they were before the crash, and most people are um, taking pay rises of 1 or 2%. Um, one can see that why some of these useless as, as Miliband's uh, policy, politics of envy is actually being quite effective. And it, would ta it takes a much better brain than mine, but I hope the panel have it. To, to, to answer that and, and, and deal with it, recognise the perception and deal with it. That's a very good point. I mean, isn't it the case that uh, part of the problem with modern capitalism is that there is a perception founded in reality that elements of the leadership class in capitalism have behaved appallingly, that actually the biggest threat of capitalism could come from the leaders of, uh, from leading capitalists? I, I think a, a couple of things on that. Um, I'm going to just really focus on the third one because that's um, the one I, I think I've got most to say on. Uh, first of all, if we were uh, a, um, a firm and we had 1%, uh, uh, sorry, 30% of our revenues coming from 1% of our clients, we'd be awfully certain to be nice to those 1% of our clients. That's pretty much the, the case for the, the UK exchequer. Right now we get 28% of, of income tax, tax comes from 1% of people. 830 companies account for about 50% of income, uh, sorry, corporation tax. So we're very, very dependent upon a very, very few number of people. Um, that said, I think that there's two very, very important things to, to separate out here. One is what's happening to the mass of the economy. And I don't mean the 1% versus the 99%. I mean the 1% versus the 99.9%. Because that's, that's the, the vast majority of people. What's happening there, and, and what I was describing about how the economy's changed and how it's become, as Liz was saying, much more dominant about your, your skills, I think all of that's good. What's happening at the very, very top? I think you put your finger on uh, another issue. And it's one of the ones that we at the IOD have been really, really keen to point out and we come out against people like Sports Direct. Um, when CEOs are essentially trying to take their shareholders for a ride. And it's, it's appalling. And um, I wish I knew what the answer was. Because if I did, I'd tell you immediately and I'd be over to Stockholm to pick up my Nobel Prize sometime later this, this uh, <laughs> talk. But um, it, it, is, it is a real problem. And, and there is that issue. And I think the Miliband um, wants to conflate what's happening in the economy as a whole, and particularly what's happening with, within highly skilled people, and where I don't have a problem, and where I don't think we want to have a problem as an economy that wants to thrive and prosper in the long term. And 
what's happening at the very top of the corporate ladder, where there is actually some issues there about how much money you're taking out of this, this system, etc. Um, and as I say, I, 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 I sense that you're finding that um, difficult to accept. And, and no, I'm not difficult to accept, but I think it could be a disaster for the Conservative Party. I think it's a disaster for the economy. I, I really, I think it's a disaster broader than the Conservative Party. It, it is really, really bad for society to see that tiny, tiny percent taking out that much capital. But I don't think it's it's one that, that even even spills over to the top one percent. I think it's much smaller than that. Liz, well, I just wanted to address the issue about the geographical uh, balance of growth, but we are seeing growth across the country. So, for example, uh, over the summer, the northeast saw the highest percentage increase of people in work and the fastest rate of company expansion of any region. So we are seeing growth, I know we're also seeing growth in Yorkshire, uh, in the northwest as well. So I think some of this is about making sure we're getting that message Absolutely. out, uh, but particularly in the regions themselves, and you know, food and farming, which I have been talking a lot about, is worth 100 billion to our economy, uh, I might have mentioned that before is actually an industry that's very distributed across the country. So we've got huge success stories, whether it's you know, Cathedral City Cheddar and their exports you know, for the West Country, or whether it's the Ilkley Brewery in Yorkshire now exporting to the US. So we've got some fantastic stories around the country of what's happening. And I think you know, what we need to do in the election campaign is really show those success stories. And we can get more success stories like that by carrying on with our economic plan. So you know, we are doing it. You know, there's an awful lot of propaganda spread by the Labour Party that just isn't true. But that's, that's, very what, that's what they do. Yeah. That's what they do. They talk while we get on with doing things. And we need to counter that by telling them what's actually happening. So, is, I mean, is there another problem which is for, for people who are pro market, which is that actually this huge economic disruption, um, we're only really, really at the beginning of this process. And so if you look at all the automation, machine learning that's coming, huge numbers of middle class jobs that are potentially at risk in the next 20, 30 years, isn't there actually quite an opportunity there for the left? How do people who are pro-market um, uh, win, win the argument in that context where technology is going to be shredding the middle classes? I think it's just, I actually just think it's taking a bit of leadership in the debate and being pro-market and unashamedly pro-market exactly. rather than yeah. trying to try yeah, and yeah. compromise on, on the message. Um, that's all I've got to say about that. Good. So <laughs> said, <laughs> so said, these two guys, for other questions, if, if I don't. Uh, on the banking situation, um, so I don't know about the specifics of the American system that you're, uh, you're referencing, but what I saw during the financial crisis when I used to arbitrate on behalf of businesses between banks on their access to finance decisions was something that relates to what I said earlier. And what I said earlier was that we had this move from a you know, removal of bank branches in the UK uh, to there's less branches around because people use mobile banking a lot more. And that meant that there was a lot of people making credit decisions that weren't close to the markets that they were making credit decisions for. And that created a problem with a bit of a vacuum. And the constant complaint that I heard at the time was that um, my bank manager doesn't understand my local needs, the local labour market, the local economic conditions. Um, of, of what I need finance, and that's why I'm being refused. So some relationship between uh, lender and lendee, or, or credit institutions, and their proximity to markets is a good thing, if I understood your question correctly. Um, on the second point, on rebalancing, I mean, look, rebalancing means different things to different people. It means from consumption to savings, it means from imports to, uh, to exports, it means from services to manufacturing, it means geographic stuff as well. Um, I often think, and this not is necessarily a, a popular view, is that there's actually, and I've been involved in this myself, I've worked in Westminster for eight years, there's a little bit of arrogance related to uh, public policy making inside the M25 because they don't necessarily, people don't necessarily understand what is in the rest of the country and how dynamic and high growth and everything else. Um, Businesses just everywhere in the country exist. I mean, I think there's this, this perception that London and the South East are the engine of economic growth, and that's it, full stop. But it's um, there's numerous pockets of um, dynamism and entrepreneurialism all around the UK. 
Yeah. Just, uh, um, um, I mean, I'm a free marketeer, and, and there's, there's no doubt that the shadow of the uh, financial crisis and the behaviour of some people in banking has, has almost toxified um, some aspects of the, of the free market agenda, but hopefully we've moved beyond that. I can't help almost thinking in terms of competition um, that we've all spent a lot of time trying to regulate but actually, if we'd have put all the effort that we've spent in legal disputes on, um, on actually uh, uh, on, on, on arguing whether or not some uh, acquisitions and others, and actually focus simply on lowering the barriers to entry, yeah. um, actually, I think probably we'd be in a lot better position in terms of the free market, free enterprise. And I think there's a big debate we're having it in Jersey. There's a big debate wider about how competition can work. Yeah. Lowering barriers to entry is the thing that one, as an unashamed free marketeer, must focus on and not get drawn into this legal wrangle of, of effectively complicated legal disputes, if I may say. So one last set of questions. Uh, gentlemen, three rows from the back here. <coughs> Lachlan Smith, New Zealand uh, High Commissioner. Minister, can I congratulate you on your argument that agriculture is not a sunset industry and, and really absolutely that, uh, that the food sector has a, has tremendous potential the growth in in uh, middle income population globally is just exponential is exploding but of course to access that exploding middle income population if your agricultural sector has to be part of the global value chains in food and one of the great impediments to that here in this part of the world, of course, is the common agricultural policy. It's not just it's insane, insane three crop. I was, in, I was in Brussels at the Agriculture Committee oh. the day when they were discussing the three crop policy. I just shook my head in wonder. Like, oh. I mean, I'm actually an agricultural scientist from way back. It's it's a terrible the, basis of that. Well, anyway, the real issue is, is access to global value chains. And mm. I've listened to uh, Philip Hammond speak on uh, what he believes needs to be part of the renegotiation with Europe. I listened to a group of MEPs, Conservative Party MEPs just a while ago, talk about the issues they think should be part of that negotiation. My question to you is, would, is the cap going to be seriously part of that negotiation because I heard none of them mention it, and uh, and yet, to me, for food to become the way you see it, uh, that would seem to be quite a critical part. I'd be really interested. Mm. Are you determined to make that that cut off? Actually, I asked a related question. Secretary of State, 20 years ago, there was very high beef exports. Mm. Britain had very high beef exports and they've tailed off because of BSE yeah. and the foot and mouth and there's still TB in cattle. Mm. And I would like to know whether you'd be the first Secretary of State to announce that they have regained that level. I think it was in the major government here, but there yeah. were very high beef exports. A farmer once said to me at the time of BSE, well, we've lost an awful lot. And he always mentioned Syria. We used to export beef to Syria, ironically, today. Mm. But I just meant to ask whether you are able to indicate whether that level of beef exports can ever be recovered, or whether that was a blip because of the market. It's related in a way to what the High Commissioner says about it. <coughs> and one last question of the gentleman at the back, please. Hi, yeah, I'm Luke Parker from Richmond Park. I'm a delegate. Uh, back to the subject of uh, making markets work. Um, the question about uh, doing it for the for you or the many, uh, I just wanted to ask about social mobility and, and your view of what role you think that plays. Uh, uh, I see us do some things, education being an obvious place where we're attacking social mobility, but still for, uh, for the economy to be successful, for people to feel like they've got access. Uh, if we're going to sell capitalism to the country, we need to make sure that everyone feels like they can be a success in that, and uh, quite a few people still feel like a face pressed against the window. So uh, uh, what do we do to break down those barriers? Thank you very much. So I'm going to ask Liz Trust to answer those specialist uh, questions on, uh, on agriculture, okay, so surely to... CAP has to be part of the renegotiation. Well, we're looking at all aspects as part of the you know, and you know, also environmental regulations and, and what we do about them is also, is also part of my portfolio. Couldn't agree with you more about the three crop rule, uh, and I've, there's a new Irish uh, agriculture commissioner coming in and I've asked him for an immediate review of it because I think it's you know, bad news telling farmers what crops they need to produce. And 
you know, whatever you might say about the common agricultural policy, we no longer have direct production subsidies, which is what we had in the past when we ended up with the wine lakes and the butter mountains. And the idea that we're saying which crops farmers should grow, I think, is wrong. Um, you know, I've got a lot of sympathy for what for what you say, and, and, and we need to uh, absolutely look at that as part of our negotiation. No doubt, I'll be talking to the Foreign Secretary about that in due course. The issue of beef exports. Also, we want to compete with things like New Zealand now, of course. Um, the the beef exports. You're absolutely right. You know, BSE was a massive devastation to our uh, beef industry from which we're still recovering. We're also dealing with bovine TB. That's why we've got a comprehensive strategy which involves um, cattle movement controls, vaccination in the edge areas and culling uh, where the disease is rife. You know, we are looking at countries like New Zealand which are on the way to dealing with their bovine TB issues as well as Ireland and Australia which has successfully eradicated bovine TB and they all did that with a comprehensive strategy that involves culling the wildlife population. So that's, that's why we're proceeding with that. We, are, um, we have made progress in terms of opening up the US market to beef. Uh, and that's one of my targets for you know, going forward is to, is to get that market reopened. So, but we, we still live with the legacy of that. And it's very interesting when you look at the competitiveness of different uh, agricultural sectors in this country actually you know, we've got a very competitive poultry industry you know wheat is you know, some of our farms produce wheat that's um, as competitive as the Canadian prairies mm. but beef you know, we still struggle with and it is a legacy of those those problems we've had and, and we are working to open up those markets and just to respond to the point on social mobility away from beef exports yes well, it's all related, of course, because there are lots of skilled jobs available in the uh, farm and food industries. Uh, you know, I, I just think uh, I wrote a paper along when I was a backbench MP called "Social Mobility and Academic Rigor," and the case it made, which I still believe to be true today, and which is why I think the EBAC is one of our most important policies, making sure that all students are studying core academic subjects, or more students are studying core academic subjects, that give them the access to those high, you know, good quality apprenticeships, good quality university courses. It's really important and unfortunately we, we've had a situation where students at grammar schools and independent schools are much likely to study subjects like sciences, maths, um, languages, which lead to those good jobs later on. So I think Studying core subjects is really important and getting higher standards, particularly uh, in maths. I will just do a plug for maths. Maths has the highest earnings premium of any subject of virtually every level. So that's why it's so important for social mobility. Thank you. Steve Hughes, I'm not going to ask you to respond on uh, beef exports, but if you could, <laughs> uh, on social mobility. On social mobility, okay. So we just kicked off a piece of research specifically looking at how. Um, around cities, whether poor transport links or the high cost of transportation can impact on uh, social mobility. And it's really interesting seeing that as a specific topic, as a barrier um, to people accessing jobs, because ultimately it's cities that are the biggest level of job creation is. There's some interesting examples from around Europe, and probably the biggest city would be, I think, that's implemented it is Tallinn in Estonia, where they've introduced a zero-based public transport fare. Um, and the reasons and the premise they did this was to allow access to jobs markets for those less well off and also for environmental concerns. And what they found since they've implemented this policy is the environmental concerns weren't really addressed because people who were travelling in cars didn't substitute that for buses despite the free, um, despite the free fare. But it did mean that those from less well off areas around in and around the city did have better access to jobs they otherwise wouldn't have done and it made it more attractive travel to those jobs as well. So schemes like that around transportation, around cities in particular, are probably quite key to developing markets that enhance social mobility. Um, I think so. I mean, I agree with everything that's been, been, been said. I think a very wise word. And anybody who haven't seen Sir Lockwood in action before the um, uh, before the national uh, na NFU um, uh, famous watches, I think your your videos on YouTube, Sir Lockwood. So I think is it, when, watch when it. was that filmed? 
earlier this year, February. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. But pretty pretty impressive, if I may say. Yeah. On social mobility, actually, I mean, I agree with the, the further education. Element. I think actually the thing that I'm very impressed with, what one of your MPs, Andrew Ledson, has been doing, is the 1001 Day Manifesto. Mm -hmm. Actually, it starts, uh, that, that, that journey on social mobility starts from conception to the age of two. I'm not a dad myself. But actually, we've got five godchildren, and actually, it is those formative years from conception to the age of two that those is the most important, where you actually build self-esteem, where you actually get a feeling that actually you're, um, you can be a productive mathematician or whatever you uh, want to do. Um, and a thousand one manifesto, I'll give that plug, because absolutely right. I hope it's in the Conservative Party manifesto. And the final word, James. Uh, thanks so much. Um, just on social mobility, because I, I know absolutely nothing about the... Um, <laughs> uh, which I'm not a politician, so I'm not going to pontificate about something in that way. It used to be, it used to be the, the, the bottom of the social mobility heap in the UK was pensioners. Um, lots of work has been done on that, um, largely through the, the largesse of the, the state pension. Um, it's now single moms, uh, and um, if you want to sort of guarantee your, your spot in the bottom 10%, uh, it's, it's really very easy. It's, it's you know, be a single, single woman, have children in your teens and that uh, you're pretty much guaranteed to stay down in that bottom comes up. It's, it's absolute tragedy. Uh, they should be pointing out the, the fallacy of, of those ways and just how terrible you're giving yourself life chances um, by falling into that trap. Um, looking further up the scale, it's very interesting to look at, uh, if, if you ask most people in Europe um, what the most common way for people to end up um, in the very high net worth, sort of uh, above 10 million uh, pounds in wealth, um, they're probably the saying inheritance. That's the third most common way to end up as somebody who's, who's very wealthy. The most common way in both the United States and in Europe is to be an entrepreneur. The second most common way is to be the CEO of a, of a large corporate. And the third most common way is to inherit it. So there is some degree of social mobility there. I think the most important one here, and this is what I close on, is if we want a lot of social mobility, and I certainly do, the best thing possible is a dyna dynamic economy. New industries throw up new opportunities yeah. in a way that exactly. nothing else can. And it's those new industries that give people the opportunity. Look, look at our, you know, in our lifetime, people make great careers in IT. And when I finished university, IT was still big piles of cardboard cards being shot through a machine. I mean, it was really, really awkward. And programming was, was just terrible. Today, it's a really dynamic industry with lots of interesting jobs and, and really great career prospects for a lot of people. So I think the more that we embrace a dynamic economy, the more that we're going to find the whole sort of thing about social mobility um, being addressed. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for your questions, for your participation. And I'd ask you to thank our panel. <laughs> <laughs>